My name's Scott. I work with uh, Fishers. We're the largest linen rental and laundry company in Scotland and uh, in the north of England. Um, I fear laundry is not as sexy as cyber terrorism, but uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. We, we see our business as a, a tourist business. We don't see ourselves as a, as a laundry business. Um, we're an integral part of uh, the success of the tourism, tourism industry within uh, the areas we serve, and that's really important to us to help drive efficiencies and effectiveness. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, RFID. This is uh, radio frequency identification chips, which aren't new technology, but in the laundry world, they become a bit more challenging because we embed them in our products. So our towels, our uh, duvets, our sheets, uh, they have to be washproof, so they have to be pretty robust. This helps us gather information to enable us to be better at our job, but also make sure that the uh, customers that we service are getting a better, a better, uh, a better experience. Um, we, um, further to a, a, an introduction from Interface, we were outside um, exhibiting. Um, we, are, we have partnered with Strathclyde University um, to help us manage the data that these chips are collecting for us. To give you an idea of scale, um, we will sell 100 million items of laundry uh, a year. Um, at peak week, it's 2.4 million, so we've got a lot, of, a lot of items passing through our doors. Um, and it's important we know more about them. Um, we have a full-time academic working with us um, as part of our KTP project. That full-time academic is analysing the big data to make it more uh, readily available for us to understand. What does that do? Well, stock control. We are a rental company, so that's absolutely fundamental. We need to make sure that that stock turns over. If it doesn't get rented out, I don't make any money because I bought that and it's not, and it's not turning. Um, subsequently, though, as well, we have hotel chains um, who really want to know what linen they have in their organisation, because if they know exactly what they've got, they can be more efficient at managing their housekeeping staff and also ensuring that uh, there's never a room put off because there's no linen. Service. Um, we, are, we, we have, um, we're the fourth largest company in the UK, but kind of smaller than the top three by, by quite some distance, but we cover the most geography pretty much. Um, so if we're delivering from, say, Perth to the Isle of Skye, it needs to be right. We need to make sure it's right when it grows out, and it's the same for Coat Bridge delivering um, down to the west coast. So to get that service right, what we have to be able to do is understand exactly um, the, the journey of that linen and make sure when we're speaking to a customer, we're speaking knowledgeably about what they're going to get and when they're going to get it and how we know that. We have huge pressures in our business just now, and I'm sure in many businesses in this room, on cost control. Um, the best thing we can try to do is um, embrace new technology to try and help us manage productivity, not only within our plant, so tracking linen through our plant so we don't touch it very much and we, we, we get the maximum benefit we can from efficiencies, but also make sure that the hotels that we service, of which we have 1,400, is to give them the best chance to make sure that the linen arrives when they need it, the housekeepers spend as little time in the room as they can because our product's right first time and it's there when they want it. Um, and that will hopefully make sure that we can manage some of the, the cost rises that are coming through the industry just now. Textile life. These chips aren't just a, 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 kind of a note to see where the linen is, although that is important. We're also, also using it as a passport. That chip now has a passport for the linen. So I know how many times that piece of linen has been washed. I know where it's been. And that's really important. I know what batch it came out of our mill is. So I can actually say, well, actually, batch A was worse than batch be because I only got 50 washes out of one and I should have got 60. That's really important to us because we can then hold our suppliers to account and say, listen, that's not good enough, we're expecting more. But also make sure the experience for the customer is much better. The customer now knows that actually we're monitoring that and we're monitoring how good the, uh, the textiles are. Our brand we've got this embedded in this now is called Fisher Zen um, and it's luxury linen with intelligence. It's high quality linen with intelligence built in to enable us to manage our business. This one is made out of, uh, out of China. Um, um, President Xi recently said it used to be the, 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 the Silk Road. It's now called the Cotton Road, pretty much. Um, and we are using that to help, help our customers and help ourselves be better at what we do. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Montgomery, um, and this is Ashling Johnson. We, uh, we both work at Musselboro Racecourse, uh, where we have been undergoing a review of our website ticketing and booking system, um, mainly to improve our customer communications and our event management. Um, most of our race course, uh, we, for those of you that don't know us, we race up to 28 times a, a year, 
Uh, we attract hopefully about 70,000 racegoers, but obviously just across 28 fixtures, that can vary between just 1,000 people on a quiet Tuesday afternoon um, to 10,000 people on our biggest event, which is our Ladies' Day. Operationally, this does challenge us. The race course was built for about 3,000 people uh, with one entrance, um, and on a race day, most race goers will arrive within about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, so having grown the business and attracting about 10,000 people, we've had to invest both with the physical layout of the race course, uh, but also with the booking system and our uh, entrance system um, to ensure that everybody can arrive with the five-star experience that we're very proud uh, to be able to shout about. Back in uh, 2007, we felt that we were really sort of leading the way in the racing industry with print-at-home tickets. Um, we worked with Scottish Enterprise to develop a system where people could book their tickets at home, um, but the communication that we had with our customers via our CRM was really quite limited. Um, so we believed that to deliver a modern event management system, we really needed to look at an integrated system that delivered a website, a booking system, and a communications tool that really helped us deliver the five-star experience that our race goers expect. So what we undertook was uh, last year we rolled out a new system, again with Scottish Enterprises' help, but with a company that could really develop a system that not only maximised the opportunities with software that was available um, on, off the shelf, but personalised it in a way that really met our, our needs and our customers' needs. So um, our new system has greatly enhanced the entire customer journey at all the touch points. Um, our mobile first approach has really helped us increase conversion. Upsells and cross sells are now tailored neatly into the booking process, which has been fantastic. With the real time sales and kind of financial tracking, we've been able to alter our marketing campaigns based on sales trends. We can really dig into the data, see what demographics are working and adjust accordingly. Advanced communications has become a key focus for us and we've been really able to personalize, which I think really helps build that relationship with our customer. It has also helped us increase retention as well, so we have, we're, we're building a, a better relationship day on day. Um, some kind of top level results, um, which I think speak for themselves. Our e-commerce conversion rate is at 5.71%, and every website visit that we have is worth £4.39, and our advanced ticket revenue is up 24% to date. I think one of the main um, advantages of this site that we didn't really anticipate fully at the beginning of the project has been the operational event management side of it. Um, this is something that the company, We Are Everyone, who we've worked with, um, has really sort of highlighted the opportunities for us. And we're really just at the beginning of exploiting this. But the, um, the imagery that we show here is just a snapshot of the race day dashboard. So like I said, we expect to um, welcome about 10,000 people on Ladies' Day within a two-hour uh, window via just two main entrances. Um, what that means is that sometimes um, over half of that crowd can turn up within a 30-minute window. So what we have to ensure is that we have enough entrances set up, the technology is swift and um, allow, recognises the e-tickets which can be printed at home, sometimes the barcode isn't brilliant. Uh, we've developed mobile um, recognition, uh, well not developed the technology, but we've invested in the technology to, so that people can just turn up with their tickets on their, their phones. Um, the pie charts show the speed of, speed of, of entry via the various different ticket types. Um, we offer a number of different packages. With sort of certain packages like marquees and everything, there might be 700 customers, but if we've only, have, we've only um, welcomed 200 of those um, package uh, purchases uh, before the first race, we know that there's a real problem um, and we're going to have a huge rush um, of the rest of the race goers who might have to navigate their way across to the marquees, the other side of the track. And what that means is that we can then move staff from other ven uh, locations on the venue uh, so that we can help guide those customers to get to their seat or their tables before the first race, which is really important for their experience. It also allows us to set up uh, flexible entrance systems, so with the um, technology that they can just carry in their hand, they can effectively open up different entrances, uh, which means that we can reduce the queues um, if they are looking like they're going to build up uh, to an unacceptable level. 
And then during the event itself, um, we can obviously make decisions with regards to uh, where the right staff need to be to make sure that our customers get the very best uh, experience. Um, so examples of that uh, would be that if um, we have the picnic tables, for example, that people reserve, and if we, again, if we find that we've had a lot of people arrive quite late on in the event, uh, it might be quite wet, it might be quite windy, we might feel that they've had a rush to get in, uh, that, that we can analyse this uh, from the office and we can coordinate the right members of staff to go and improve their experience with some surprise and delight. Um, so even if we haven't got it quite right, which is often you know, the case in live events, uh, we can mitigate that experience and hopefully surprise our customers with some extra ideas that can improve uh, their um, memories of coming to Musborough Race Schools. Um, so data really is the future at Mossborough Racecourse. I think over the next year we're going to um, really heavily focus on personalisation um, at all the touch points for our customers. We're going to be introducing loyalty schemes, looking at simplifying our customer renewals and upsells, um, personal greetings at our turnstiles, so when our customers come in we can give them that kind of personalised approach. And ultimately, making our Race Scores Day feel more special. I have got a whole heap of new ideas from listening to all the other speakers this morning, um, which has been fantastic. But that's, I think, where we can see it going for us. Um, and yeah, again, uh, just hopefully in the future, um, we'll be able to replicate some of the attractions uh, that may already have uh, self-scan entry systems. You can imagine how much faster that would be on our race days. Uh, direct messaging during our events to help educate people as to when the next race is off, uh, what the favourite horse is, uh, what the best jockeys that are attending, but also where they can find the quickest um, uh, access to the loos, uh, where, the, where the bars are quieter perhaps. Uh, just managing those customer expectations through their journey uh, to make them aware that we are really monitoring and doing the very best that we can to give them a, a fantastic day. Um, we work closely with the police. We've got a fantastic relationship uh, with them and we will be able to roll out our race day dashboard to their control unit so they can see from, a, from wherever they are, whether it's um, from their control unit or even back at their, their station, they can see how the event is operating. Um, and from a safety point of view, that's been really important and something that the police have really welcomed um, in terms of the crowd management and behaviour of, of our um, race goers. And then really looking forward to the future, we would really like to be able to recognise customers' likes and dislikes before they arrive. Um, but, and so we can personalise their experience so when they book a table in the restaurant, we already know their favourite wine. Um, so we'd like to be able to record that and really help that uh, drive the experience but also drive our revenue. Um, and then we've just got a quick video for anybody that hasn't been to Boston Race Schools uh, to give you a quick overview of, of, of what we do. There are big countries and there are small countries. There are big and small race courses. And there's one thing we all know. It's not the size that matters. It's the energy and the creativity that truly make the difference. We're all drawn to that spirit of independence, that uniqueness and strength of character that only a smaller venue can deliver. And so it is with Musselburgh, the oldest racecourse in Scotland. Racecourse to the city of Edinburgh, the most beautiful and distinctive of capital cities. At Musselburgh, expect the welcome, the racing, the food and drink, and the pride of place which mark this racecourse out in a first class of its own. Small is certainly more beautiful in this location by the sea, with air non fresher. This race course stands apart from its competition with a sense of style and of quality which ranks it amongst the finest jewels in Scotland. Experience the difference at Musselburgh. Truly Scotland's six star race course. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ollie Davis. I am, fortunately, I'm a head of marketing. Um, I feel like I should apologise to Peter for that. Um, I'm the head of marketing for the Fringe Society. For those who don't know, the Fringe Society is the charity that was established 
by artists of the Fringe to act as the custodian of our festival um, more than 50 years ago now. And what I'm here to talk to you about is one of the centerpieces of the Fringe itself, um, which is our Virgin Money Street events, which take place every year on both the Royal Mile uh, and the Mound uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, as it's uh, approaching lunchtime, I thought there's nothing better than to do a bit of audience participation. Um, so what I want to ask you guys is, can you put your hands up if you currently have cash in your pocket? That could be any amount of cash. Okay, so we're probably looking at around about two-thirds of you. Um, same question, who has a contactless card on them? Excellent. Okay, so I didn't practice that beforehand, but the, gr the good news is that ETAG have done its research, got a representative audience. Um, around about two-thirds of um, the British public now have a contactless card. That number's gone up significantly in recent years, and there are now 119 million cards in circulation. What that looks like in practice, 2008's been an interesting, 2018, sorry, has been an interesting year for lots of reasons, but one of those things you may not know is that it's also referred to as peak cash. I'm not sure whether anyone's heard of this, but essentially cash and card transactions have been converging, as you can see on this graph, over the last several years, but 2018 was the moment at which that crossed over. So this year there were 13.1 uh, billion cash transactions, the same number of cards, but just to put that into context, contactless payments made up 5.6 billion of the card payments, and that's doubled in a year. Um, so this is an area that's, that's only set to go one way, um, which is obviously driven largely by convenience for us, which is fantastic. The problem is, imagine if you're a street performer and your method of payment is this, which is probably familiar to lots of us, the, um, uh, the passing the hat at the end of a performance or the guitar case next to a busker. Um, what we understood, uh, having spoken to our street performers, is that across the world, these guys will travel up and down the land across seas um, and are paid through the donations, the generosity of people who come and see their work. But that's not easy uh, when there's less cash in people's pockets. And actually, when we asked our street performers, they reflected that over the last few years, they've seen a real terms decrease of about 25% in their income. So a really massive challenge. And if you think that uh, on any given street events year, we'll get 800 different performers, um, we'll have 150 shows a day in six different performance areas, you can multiply that problem up and it becomes a massive one particularly in light of the Fringe's core principle, which is the idea that if you have a show and an, and an audience ready for you and a venue willing to host you, you are welcome. No one's going to define that you can or can't perform. So this is a sort of ultimate expression of what the Fringe is all about. So what were we going to do about it? Well, what we started off by doing is getting together a, a small focus group of street performers that represented the full breadth of both performance type but also different areas that they worked in and asked them before we looked at what the solution would be, what did we need to deliver? Because obviously this is something in the, the hat that's passed around that's centuries old, that's very, very familiar to most of the performers. And what they told us was that clearly uh, what this solution needed to be was something that could be easily incorporated into their performance, so it's not something that's gonna sit there and distract the audience at a key time, but also when it comes to the moment of asking for that cash, it's really quick and easy to use. Um, we all know that Edinburgh is uh, glorious in August and there is no such thing as anything other than unbroken sunshine, but on those moments when it does rain or snow, um, we needed this to work in all weather conditions. Uh, we also needed it to work with intermittent Wi-Fi signal. We also needed it to work in areas with no power. Um, so a few challenges that sort of needed to be thrown into the mix. Clearly, it also needed to be 100% secure for audience members. Uh, we have visitors from all over the world. Familiarity with contactless payment varies. Um, our, our North American friends, for example, are a little bit further um, behind on adaption of contactless payments uh, in sort of regular service. That's, that's catching up. So there was a need to try and explain this really simply. And perhaps the most important one that we hadn't thought about beforehand was how we reconcile the thing. Um, because if you imagine you've got 800 different performers all trying to kind of put something into one single system, how can we get that money out to the performers again as quickly as possible whilst also guaranteeing security? So that was a big challenge. And then, of course, that openness to everyone. So 
that was our challenge. Uh, what we then set about to do with our partners, Virgin Money, who were the headline sponsors of the Fringe, was to try and find a solution that ticked all these boxes, which is not straightforward, but actually, um, I'm not sure how many in the room have heard of iZettle, but this was a... Uh, an option that came to us relatively early on and ticked uh, a lot of those boxes. So iZettle, for those who don't know, um, have made a real name for themselves in supporting small businesses, a lot of cafes and restaurants, with these straightforward point-of-sale devices. You've probably come across one of these readers if you didn't know iZettle's name. Um, but rather serendipitous serendipitously for us, they set up a new office in Edinburgh earlier this year, and at the same time, they were looking to take this technology and take it into an outdoor setting. So working together with Virgin Money and they, we set about trying to create the world's first contactless street festival. Um, now, what does that look like in practice? Well, this is the kind of standard journey, sort of broken down, happy to talk through in more detail afterwards if anyone has more specific questions. But the idea is that uh, as an individual street performer, I can create a unique account within, nested within the Fringe's master account. I can then select a donation value that can be variable. So typically it was between two and five pounds per transaction. That was then clearly defined, written on the card reader, which you'll see uh, in a second for complete clarity for the audience. The audience then tap their card against the reader at the end of the performance, and then within three seconds, the reader is ready to receive another payment. So if you imagine that moment when everyone's kind of clapping and cheering and you've got a limited window as a performer to get as much uh, uh, money as you can, this allows that uh, to happen fairly seamlessly. Uh, the reader itself is connected uh, to a phone that sits with the device uh, via Bluetooth. That then passes the payment details into the main iZettle system, where it sits straight away, transferred into the Fringe account, and at the end of the Fringe, we're able to reconcile that straight away and pass that funding back to the artist. And so you can see here a fairly virtuous cycle that's created um, over the course of the process. So that's what we created. How did it go down? Well... Uh, these are not exhaustive in terms of the results, but I think we're pleased to report that, first of all, the system was able to run uh, with minimal disruption throughout the fringe, which was a real positive, as this year was our, was our test. We had over 100 performers sign up. Um, and if you think this is a group of people who've been working with one method of payment as a sort of built into their DNA for a long, long time. We felt that was really exciting. And actually, another thing that was quite interesting was that the average transaction was £3.50. And if I asked a follow-up question of people in the audience, how many people have more than £3.50 in coins in their pocket, I suspect it wouldn't be that many. So actually, we found that that transaction value has, has been really good. And clearly, some artists pick up, picked up on it more than others, but those that used it were really positive about the fact that this, alongside a more traditional way of, of payment, actually has helped underpin um, and actually push up that uh, income that they're getting on a year-by-year -year basis. And then clearly this wasn't the main driver for us, but it was nice um, that there was really good press coverage in both The Guardian, the BBC, Daily Mail, uh, The Eye, and various other news channels that really raised awareness not just of this pro uh, promotion, but also of the work of our street performers more generally. It wasn't all uh, smiles and light, and these are things that we need to deal with um, over the next uh, uh, few years. Um, mobile signal, I'm not sure any of you guys who were in August, uh, but there were, there were some real issues, particularly around EE and um, availability um, of service at certain points, which did affect the service. Um, the gap between transactions, whilst that three seconds doesn't sound like much, when you've built an audience that in some ways is sort of wanting to surreptitiously view something and then run away again, actually having three seconds to do so may be uh, that wee bit too much. So we need to explore ways of, of bringing that down if we can. Um, it will take time for all artists to buy in. Some people were completely on board with this. Others were saying sort of over my dead body, you're not in any way going to get me uh, to do this. But obviously, as we've heard a lot today, as technology advances, as it becomes more business as usual, inevitably, if we've provided that space, hopefully people will buy into it. Um, and I think the, th the final one that I'd probably like to dwell on a wee bit is that final bullet point, which is how do we ensure, and I think this is a challenge for a lot of technology solutions at the minute, how do we ensure that that personal moment, so one street form referred to it to me as, 
you know, a parent dropping some money into their kid's pot hand and that being passed on. That sort of rite of passage, which is for many children that first experience of, of the arts, how do we recreate the magic of that moment? And I don't think we've quite got there yet, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna stop until we do. Um, so hopefully that gives you a, a real whistle-stop tour of what we did in Tap to Tip. More than happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, do come up and speak to me, but thanks ever so much.